hands-on discussion about how things are changing and how practitioners are handling um, complicated matters. Um, North Carolina is facing a pretty uh, egregious appellate lawsuit at this point that uh, could end up invalidating third-party standing um, that was granted under Bozeman. So we need all of the best minds present to help us figure out how to handle these issues um, that are developing daily. Uh, so if you are interested in attending FLI in Carborough in April, April 15th through 17th, please come pick up one of these and apply quickly. <laughs> um, we need you there. We need all of your minds present. Can I just say, those are the best, I guarantee you will not regret if you go to those meetings. They are the most intellectually engaging, just fascinating, interesting discussions I have ever participated in. And I think we're, we're just about out of time. We have a little bit more time, but I wanted to make sure um, before I left to tell you all, I, you know, I've been practicing exclusively in the area of LGBT rights with major emphasis on family law for about 23 years now and I firmly believe from the bottom of my heart that the most creative, important, innovative work in our legal movement is done by family law practitioners on the ground in state courts who have just come up with amazing ways to protect our families and are having to deal in a way that many people don't appreciate with just the heartbreaking challenges of trying to find ways to keep our families together, to get the law to respect our families, to protect the children in these families. And I really take my hat off to all of you for shouldering that burden and for I think a lot of the unrecognized work that, that you all do. But you're like an amazing collective brain trust. And that is the purpose of this Family Law Institute NCLR co-sponsors it with the National LGBT Bar Association to try to find a way to highlight and capitalize on all of that experience and creativity and let people share their experiences with each other and kind of cross fertilize and get synergy going between different states and it is so much fun. It is really an amazing experience and I really hope that some of you will, if you can't, you know, I hope you can come to this one, but they happen periodically. Uh, there's several of them throughout the year, so if you can't make this one, get on the, the list and you can see when the next ones are coming up, but we really, we need all of you. So thanks so much for coming here today and um, hope to see some of you at the FLI meeting <laughs> in April. Thanks, y'all. Well, thank you so much for joining us um, for this first workshop. Um, my name is Sarah Hawk. Um, I'm the Advocacy and Organizing Manager. Um, advocacy and Organizing Manager, Organizing Manager for Narrow Pro Choice North Carolina. Um, we're a statewide group, and I worked there for about six months. Um, I graduated college, um, really scary, just a little under maybe 10 months ago, um, and I'm still figuring out like what the real world is like, so that's really new for me too. Um, so I moved to Raleigh six months ago, so North Carolina is also really new to me. Um, so I am super, super happy to be here with you all. Um, so I'm a queer feminist activist. Um, I'm a sex blogger. Um, I'm an educator. Um, really, really, really passionate um, about the intersection of what it means to be queer and be involved in this reproductive rights work. Um, and I'm so happy to be here with you all, so thanks for coming. Hey y'all, um, I'm Jen. I organize at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, with Students United for Reproductive Justice. Um, and then I also work with Benevolence Farm, which is a re-entry employment and housing program located in Alamance County, North Carolina. Um, and yeah, I'm here to help co-facilitate and share in this awesome, creative, and powerful space with all y'all. So thanks for being here. Great. Um, oh, duh. Cool. <laughs> um, so we wanted to start out the workshop um, just by settling in and talking about colonization and colonialism. And we put uh, index cards hopefully on every table. We didn't have a ton. But we just wanted to start the first five to 10 minutes self-reflecting internally on what each of our places 
are in colonization as a process that is ongoing. Um, so if y'all wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to just write down some thoughts, feelings that you have, and I guess thinking about the question of what is my place in this process and what does that look like for me as an individual and what does that look like in this space today and recognizing the land that we're on right now and thinking about that. Great. Just take a few minutes um, and then we'll go around and we'll do introductions. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, so thought we'd start with an overview of just an overview, um, start with an overview of what reproductive health rights and justice are, um, so we can ground the space again, um, really in talking about what are these really, really important movements. Um, and I also want to emphasize, um, so I work for NARAL, but, but I'm not an expert, and I know that there are lots of folks in the room who have experiences working in this movement. Um, so, um, um, so I encourage you to speak up, um, shout it out, raise your hand, whatever you want to speak, please do so. Because um, I'm not the only one speaking up here, I want you all to be part of this too. So, um, reproductive health. Um, so there are really three movements within this large frame. So reproductive health, um, so it's a service delivery model. Reproductive health groups really provide health services, um, they do health education, um, which as you see um, can include abortion care, it can include birth control, it can include sex ed, all of that good stuff. Um, the reproductive rights framework, um, that's where I'm coming from. Uh, it's a legal and advocacy based model, um, focusing on protecting the legal right to access reproductive health care services, um, centered on bodily autonomy, and it has a large focus on protecting abortion access. Um, reproductive justice. This is something that's really important and that we're going to spend some time talking about in this first section. Um, as defined by Sister Song, reproductive justice is the human right to have children, not to have children, and to parent the children that we do have in a safe and healthy environment, as well as the human right to bodily autonomy from any form of reproductive oppression. Um, so the RJ framework focuses on the intersecting oppressions that we face, um, it looks at power structures and it centers the most marginalized. Everybody good? Any questions? So I hope you all can see this okay. Um, this is kind of an overview of the organizations within our movement. Um, certainly not all of them. It's just kind of a selection. So you'll see over here on the left we have reproductive health. Um, so for example, talking about Planned Parenthood. Um, so, um, so they're in the reproductive health and the reproductive rights sections. Um, um, so Planned Parenthood has a C3 wing, which is gonna be providing the health care, and a C4 wing, which is, um, which is focusing on the political advocacy. Um, I worked for Planned Parenthood when I first graduated and I worked for their C4 side as an organizer. So we have a lot, um, we have a lot of groups up here, um, Planned Parenthood, the Abortion Care Network, Backline, just to name a few. Um, we have NARAL up here, of course, um, Free Productive Rights, Planned Parenthood, the National Abortion Federation, we have Advocates for Youth, with Reproductive Justice, um, Sister Song, Sister Reach, um, Forward Together, Women with a Vision, Spark, really great groups. Um, we will give you a list of these at the end so you will know who to look up, um, who is doing this really awesome work. Um, but that's just kind of an overview, kind of an overview of the three movements. Super quick, I know, but we only have an hour now left together, so I want to make sure that we get through all of this. Um, a little bit more on RJ. Um, it's an intersectional framework. It examines race, examines gender identity, examines income level, ability, sexual orientation, um, age, examines your immigration status within the context of reproductive oppression. Um, another really important point about RJ, um, so we're talking about RJ. We're talking. Um, we're talking about RJ. We're talking. We're talking about communities. RJ is community based, um, and it links reproductive freedom to the conditions within one's own community, not just on an individual level, which is really, really important. Um, it was created by women of color. It was born out of a need to discuss health needs for women of color, which mainstream white organizations were not doing, like NARAL, like Planned Parenthood. It's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, it's important to know, really, it's important to, <coughs> it's important to know 
really where RJ came from, why it was developed, um, really good. So thinking about the RJ lens, so the reproductive justice lens is, means that we apply this framework to a certain issue um, and it becomes really broad, really, really intersectional. Um, so I'll go through this and we have some examples as well to illustrate this. Um, thinking about RJ requires us to go beyond the main issues that again, large, mainstream, mainly white reproductive health and rights organizations, Planned Parenthood, NARAL, et cetera, um, because RJ is about much more than abortion access, which when we're talking about NARAL and Planned Parenthood, that's what they tend to focus on, is abortion access and also birth control. But RJ expands to pretty much everything. Um, applying the RJ lens to a given issue really helps us see that RJ is a universal concept. Um, since RJ um, since RJ is intersectional, since it's community-based, <coughs> and it's rooted in the human right to be free and healthy from oppression, it encompasses almost everything. It's really powerful, it's really awesome, and I would encourage you to do some more research on it because it's really fantastic. Um, the RJ lens connects communities and issues that may seem unrelated at first, but are actually intrinsically linked. Um, I'll go through a couple of examples as well. So the water crisis in Flint. Um, when we're talking about Flint, um, talking, um, when we're talking about environmental justice, that is reproductive justice. Um, contaminated toxic water is damaging to families. Between 9,000 to 10,000 children and a couple thousand of pregnant people have already been exposed to this contaminated water. Um, Parents have used this toxic water to prepare formula and have breastfed their children after drinking the water. Also, for pregnant people, lead can increase the risk of preterm delivery, low birth weight, and miscarriage. Um, and so, I think it was a Democratic debate maybe two months ago, um, and a lot of folks were saying, well, they're not talking about reproductive health, they're not talking about rights, but they were talking about Flint. Flint is an RJ issue, it's reproductive health, it's reproductive rights. It focuses on a person's right to live within a healthy and safe environment. And if you can't, that's not RJ, that's not just. Um, so we really want to push you all, and the world in general, I guess, to think about these topics that aren't being talked about within the mainstream and thinking about them specifically um, I'm thinking about them as issues that relate to RJ. Sound good? Any questions so far? Um, so again, like I said, the Flint water crisis, absolutely an RJ issue. Um, it interferes with the human right, um, with the human right to parent children in a healthy environment and live free from conditions, um, live free from conditions that may make it unable to even have children. Um, second example, talking about police brutality. Um, Again, a central tenet of RJ is the right to parent your child in a healthy and safe environment. If you're in a community that is devastated by police brutality, that's not a healthy community, it's not a safe community. Um, RJ links community conditions, again, it's a really, really important part of RJ. Um, so it links community conditions to reproductive destiny and sexual and reproductive self-determination. So, um, so quote, um, let's see. Um, um, so if black parents are constantly living under the threat of violence for themselves, their children, or their potential future children, this is not reproductive justice, not at all. Um, if you aren't safe in your community because you're racially profiled by the police, that's not really a full articulation of reproductive justice. Um, police brutality is also detrimental to queer survival. Talking about trans women of color, they are direct targets of police violence. Um, as Princess Harmony Rodriguez writes, black and our Latina transgender people often find ourselves a target of increased police hostility because of white supremacist, transphobic policing being distinctly opposed to our continued existence. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement and the RJ movement are linked. They just are. Um, and it's really, really, um, excuse me, um, um, it's really, really important to really recognize that and to understand that these movements are not separate, they are linked. Um, and we want folks 
to be thinking about this as we get in our groups today for this workshop, um, to always be thinking, um, to always be thinking deeper, and to think, um, to be thinking deeper, and to think really critically. It's important. Um, so you may be wondering, how is this all relevant? Um, our workshop is based on reproductive rights. Yes, um, but we thought it was incredibly important to start with an overview of RJ, because um, RJ allows us to think about issues in a deep and an intersectional way. Um, RJ should already center queer and trans voices. The reproductive rights, um, on the reproductive health and rights movements, however, while while they may aim to include queer and trans folks, ultimately fail to do so. Um, in my work with NARAL and with Planned Parenthood, I've been incredibly <coughs> frustrated that so much of the framing like about health issues is just really straight and really cis. Um, talking about reproductive health only as a women's health issue is not enough. Talking about abortion as a women's issue, it's not a women's issue. Um, Trans folks and non-binary folks can get pregnant. This is an issue for everyone. Um, so in my work, I found that it was a huge struggle. Um, I had someone, um, when I was previously employed, tell me that, it, that it's not important enough to focus on because queer and trans folks are such a small part within the community. And that's not OK. Like, I never want anybody to tell me that I'm only like a small percent of a community, that my voice and my experiences and my body have no weight and have no matter. Um, so that's why I'm really, really passionate um, about this work. I think it's incredibly important. Um, so the purpose for the workshop, um, we want to get to a place where we want to get to a place where reproductive rights organizations do include and also center queer and trans people. While we come from a reproductive rights background, we want to draw from RJ's practices of centering marginalized voices. Um, we're going to do some group work in a little bit, um, and we want you to think about uh, we want you to think about this RJ lens when you're in your groups. Um, try to apply the RJ lens to topics we offer you. I'm going to think about them in a to think about them in think about them in an intentional way to go outside the mainstream. So if you hear things from Planned Parenthood, from NARAL, from these larger organizations, um, try to dig deeper. We really want to have like a really radical conversation here, and, and we want to push you all to do that and also support you in doing that. Um, so in your groups, we want you to think about some questions. Um, and I'll go through the groups in a minute. Um, what does it mean to center queer and trans voices? Have you ever experienced a part of the reproductive rights movement where you felt that queer and trans voices were centered? Um, what did that feel like? And primarily, what would blank look like if queer and trans voices were centered? Um, now I'll, I'll bring Jen back up here. Um, we're just going to talk through an example. Um, we think it might be helpful for y'all to see kind of what we envision as this activity moves forward. Um, for, so for example, um, how can we queer sex education so that queer and trans folks are prioritized? Um, so in your groups, and again, I'll go through them in a minute, um, we want you to think about your certain issue. We want you to brainstorm, come up with a list of how does that certain issue how, how is it not inclusive right now? And what are the steps you can take to make it more centering for queer and trans folks? And we can, um, and we'll go through our example and we can, um, and we can answer any questions you might have on that as well. Cool. So in thinking about this, one of the examples that came up for us that we talk about a lot is how to queer sex ed and what that would look like if queer and trans folks were at the center of that and prioritized in that way. And some ideas that we came up with were sex for pleasure, a radical idea. Um, and I think if we are centering queer and trans folks, that the idea that sex can only be for reproduction is lessened. And obviously reproducing happens um, and can happen. And if people want that to happen, yes. But I think sex for pleasure would be 
much more accepted um, if larger mainstream organizations were talking about it in a way that centered queer and trans folks. Um, another example of like a possible thing that could happen if we were talking about sex ed in that way um, is that this idea that motherhood and femininity are or femaleness are intrinsically related would be lessened. It would go away. Who can parent and who's allowed to parent? Who has access to parenting? And what does that look like? And how is that gendered? And if we're querying these ideas, the binary, the gender binary kind of becomes less of a huge deal and isn't, it's not at the center. What's at the center is human rights, which is the reproductive justice framework. Um, so yeah, breaking into the groups, we'd love for y'all to work together and think collaboratively and and really dig deep and think about what our different movements could look like if, if we were centering our voices and if we were making all of these really important decisions at the center of the movement. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, so we have some groups. Um, as you'll see around the room, there are sheets of paper. Um, you can go towards whatever group you want. They're not pre-assigned or anything. Um, I hate that. So just gravitate towards whatever you want. So I'm gonna to try to read these. Um, we have justice um, uh, over here. Um, uh, um, we have justice for immigrant families, um, family and birth over there, um, sexual violence on college campuses, um, Medicaid expansion, abortion access, and birth control, birth control and menstruation. Um, what we're gonna do, we're gonna get in groups for maybe half an hour or so, um, and then we're all going to present to each other. Um, and the ultimate goal is to leave with some ideas, with some tools that you can take back home with you for organizing, um, some tools you can take home with you for organizing for these issues. Are there any questions about groups or the activity? Any clarification? Um, so we were talking about what it means to center queer and trans voices in the talk about Medicaid expansion. We were talking about how um, a lot of people just have this false idea of who accesses and benefits from Medicaid expansion. We just kind of see the image of this welfare queen. There's a false image that you really have to look to find. We were saying that uh, the reality of Medicaid is that it's for families, it's for queer and trans folks, it's for LGBT folks, and people don't see the struggle and the uh, good things that Medicaid offers to people. And the thing about this is it could benefit everyone if we just include the voices of uh, queer and trans voices talking about single, low-income people. It would just bring individuals to the forefront. Um, we were also talking about uh, a good example of how queer and trans voices are centered is the Ryan White program when it comes to HIV care, if anyone's familiar with that. If you're low income and you have HIV, you can get medication automatically through Ryan White. And that's a primary preventative notion that um, says that we're going to give money on the front end to benefit long term and benefit the country as a whole, lowering transmission rates, lowering uh, ER visits and uh, intensive care later on because we're providing medicine at the forefront. And that's including uh, trans and queer voices at the forefront of that issue. And just looking at that program and emulating that and giving health care to people who are low on income regardless of disability and household size and marriage status uh, it helps everybody, it helps our economy because we save money uh, if we invest in preventative and primary care. Uh, people also, if we look at queer and trans voices at the forefront of the issues, usually we talk about mental health and holistic health a lot more when we talk about these issues, and that's bringing that to Medicaid expansion as well, and prevention and primary care. So you get a bit more holistic care with this kind of Medicaid expansion if you were to look at the LGBT community as an example. <coughs> um, do I need to add anything? <laughs> I think that's all. Does that sound good? Yeah, okay. that's great. Thank all you. right, thank you.
So we were talking about querying and including more trans voices in the discussion about sexual assault on college campuses. Some of the things that we came up with were changing the language that's used in talking about policies and uh, specifically Title IX policies and, um, and then preventative education that happens on college campuses, usually in the orientation week. Um, so including the queer and trans voices in, in those sessions. We talked about the um, we talked about the ways that the Title IX policy ha has uh, many mandated reporters on college campuses that aren't trained in um, LGBT 101 sessions uh, and therefore aren't uh, able to support the folks that are reporting, um, but, uh, but also often don't tell folks that are reporting that they're mandated reporters, um, which then creates a cycle of re-victimization and a lack of support and resources for those folks. We talked about training for law enforcement officials on college campuses that would go as far as um, LGBT 101s and, and then uh, more support and resources from, from those offices. We talked a lot about um, addiction and alcohol abuse on college campuses going hand in hand with sexual assaults um, and and the lack of resources, the lack of discussion that happens within the queer community itself about violence within relationships um, and alcohol use and their the subsequent violence that ensues after alcohol use and substance abuse. Um, we talked about the Greek life system, which I actually don't know a lot about because I work at a liberal arts college, but that's why I work at a liberal arts college. <laughs> um, we talked a lot about needing to include more about disability when talking about sexual assault on college campuses um, and talking about queer folks with disabilities and different abilities, including their voices in the consensual sex orientation sessions that happen, and I read that and I can't read it. The, the community accountability resources, uh, so if folks aren't interested in going to law enforcement officials, that there are perhaps other resources available or able to be developed that include community accountability. Um, that's a wrap. Awesome. <laughs> Hello, yeah. um. Do you hear me okay standing right here? All right, so we were talking about family and birth. Um, and what was really cool was just, you know, um, for me, like looking at the people that made up our group, um, people who have families, people who want to um, give birth, and people who work within these like healthcare systems, and as far as like what um, training and education and stuff looks like. And so I won't like touch on that, but I think that that's really, um, cool to know the, the components that kind of went into this discussion, right? So um, so the first thing we have here is visibility. So when we were talking, it was a lot about like what does family look like and what does family look like for like queer communities and you know um, just different you know lifestyles and identities and everything like that. So what that looks like when you're navigating maybe like a hospitalization or something like that when it's you know Someone mentioned like having to distinguish if like education or like counseling was provided or to a family member or a friend, and so what kind of that might look like. Um, so yes, getting like what different families look like on the table, right? And then um, talking about cultural competencies. So how many, how much of the time, like as like queer people, we often have to educate the people who are supposed to be like helping us with our own healthcare, you know, and like. Um, what different um, trainings could look like um, in terms of centering queer and trans folks. Like, speaking for myself, like, I'm a nursing student, right? And so we hardly talk about, like, our people at all, um, which is heartbreaking, um, especially when you think about all the people that are going through this curriculum and this program that uh, just, you know, are 
um, excited to learn, but just aren't given that opportunity. Um, so if we center our voices, then you know, we can see a lot more of that happening. Um, and I think also just uh, recognizing that in like the healthcare system and a lot with like birth and um, pregnancy, how much um, we need to honor the history of you know people's stories and stuff. And so what trauma looks like and like how um, in the hospital and just like any you know healthcare place, like our people have been traumatized like repeatedly. And so we often like. Um, may not go or you know what it looks like to be your own advocate and like how hard that can all be um, so so yeah so honoring our own history and the resilience that we've had to um, come up with right and um, medicalization of labor so what it looks like when there's this hierarchy of you know you have these healthcare professionals telling you what your body should be doing um, instead of you know really empowering uh, patients to to listen and, and feel what what your body needs um, and then we talked about like adoption challenges and um, even legality of it right and then um, talking about primary care for trans mass patients um, and better ways to um, comfort our people and um, yeah I guess that that kind of summarizes it in kind of a way. Uh, does that sound okay? Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. When I came up to justice for immigrant families I really didn't have any ideas but um, we're discussing our various experiences the ACLU, rape crisis, and also now. And uh, we talked about, you know, first and foremost, uh, we've noticed that there's not a lot of uh, stuff outside of English in so many of these uh, service organizations. So making them multilingual and not just the written materials, but giving presentations. Um, and then, uh, you know, there, when you're talking about uh, queer people in these marginalized immigrant and then families, there's a lot of in intersection that you need to take account of and um, have somebody who is living all those intersections to be the person that's speaking to the immigrant uh, families about uh, the justice, uh, reproductive justice. Um, oh, uh, visa application process uh, to um, make that kind of reflecting the recent passage of uh, laws and uh, so you know if you have a queer couple then you know they're they can have legal uh, rights uh, and you know be on the path to citizenship um, just like a straight couple would um, uh, Uh, having safe spaces, uh, apparently, uh, what was the, which, uh, We're talking about like, creating change how ICE was invited, change. like making sure you don't have officers in safe spaces for people of color. Yeah, so, uh, you know, people went to that creating change meeting and then were, you know, extremely frightened, so ICE and other uh, enforcement uh, organizations definitely should have these uh, intersectionality uh, presentations but at a different safe space so that uh, you know, whoever is listening over there can completely listen and not have any fear while they're being um, there's uh, detention centers and uh, also need to be focusing on the LGBT and reproductive justice 
and that intersectionality with, uh, you know, different cultures, different uh, languages. Um, we talked about the invisible knapsack, um, you know, uh, when I was on a kickball team, I was on a, a all female, the first all female kickball team uh, out of this uh, league, and it was surprising to me to see that uh, the teams that were uh, mainly gay people were, you know, saying things that they didn't realize were discriminatory, or maybe they did, to people who were trans, and you know, people understanding that there, even within the queer community, there are levels of privilege, and uh, you know, to notice that and try to uh, acknowledge it, and acknowledging uh, the history and uh, leadership um, in our country and within the various uh, uh, cultural groups that are needing this uh, help. access to birth control in the first place, and um, how do we frame our conversations about it in society. Can you, uh, I think that's it. Okay, so um, we talked about uh, deconstructing the shame that is often associated with people getting on birth control. So like this concept that uh, young women who get on birth control are getting on it uh, specifically to have sex with cis women, uh, and that there aren't other reasons, uh, which there are many for different situations. Um, and also separating conversations about birth control and menstruation from gender identity because there are lots of trans and non-binary people that are affected and need access to birth control. Um, we talked about making products readily available for folks. Um, so people who are low income have limited access to uh, birth control or tampons and pads and things like that because they are really expensive. Um, that also affects folks in the homeless community, uh, which is disproportionately made up of trans and queer people. Um, yes. uh, we talked about health uh, concerns associated with um, tampons and pads, like what type of products people have access to. Um, we also need to expand on conversations on why different people need access to birth control. So talking about why people might want to get on it because they have cramps or things like that, but also um, kind of separating this pressure on people to explain why they need access to that type of health care. Uh, we really need to emphasize education. I wrote a lot of notes. Um, <laughs> yeah, we need education to be more trans friendly and more available. and. Um, we talked about different solutions to some of the big problems that we see, such as like potentially uh, providing uh, more healthcare information in community centers and uh, providing more spaces with free access to tampons and pads and things like that that people really need and don't otherwise have access to. Thanks, everyone. Um, those were some really, really brilliant ideas. So thank you all for sharing and working in your groups um, so awesomely. So just to wrap up, um, this will leave you with some resources. So these RJ groups that I mentioned before, um, they are really, really badass. And they are doing, so, so, so what they're doing, so it's really intersectional, and it is centering folks who are queer and trans. And I would um, really encourage you to check all of these amazing groups out. Um, if you want to write them down, take a picture of this slide. They're doing the work um, when you can learn from them. And I would encourage you to because they're all really, really awesome. Um, so I'll leave this up here for a minute. Um, I know we had an announcement 
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for giving me an opportunity. Yeah, no, I just wanted sure. to share with folks that um, this was a really interesting exercise, given the fact that I'm um, starting a project for uh, trans, queer, butch, gender fluid, expansive, pregnant people who would like to learn about childbirth education and labor and comfort measures, um, poly folks as well. Um, in a non-traditional setting. So I'm hoping to bring this class to a city near you. Um, and if you'd like more information, um, I have this here, uh, you can get a, a flyer. Um, I'm certified by the International Childbirth Education um, uh, Certification and other things. But um, if you're interested or you want to talk about it or you know where uh, I might be useful, I'm really excited about this work. So thanks, my name is Lucia. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Um, so with that, it's almost 545. Um, so I again want to thank you all for coming. Um, this was really awesome. Um, here's our contact information. If you want to email us, get in touch with us, um, that would be great. Um, I would love to hear from you. That's me on the top. And that's Jen on the bottom. Um, and if you're in Raleigh or Durham, let us know. We can have coffee, chat about all this kind of stuff. Um, we'd love to talk to you again. So just thank you all so much for coming. Um, uh, sorry, we're going to start a little late, but it's great to have uh, so many folks here. Uh, to the LGBT divide, my name is Brad Sears, and I'm the executive director of the Williams Institute. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the Williams Institute? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> if you're not, we're a research center um, on sexual orientation and gender identity, law and public policy at UCLA School of Law. We've been around for about 15 years. Uh, and our mission is really uh, to work with a bunch of talented researchers, two of them who you'll meet today, uh, to do research on LGBT issues. And although we're an academic research center, our focus is really to do research uh, that's relevant, uh, that has practical applications, uh, and that people can use. So our main goal in being here today is really just to um, get to know you, have you get to know more about our research and how to access it. So uh, we're going to talk about some of the research that we've done with the focus on the research in the South, um, then Andrew Flores, who's an expert on public opinion uh, in general and on LGBT issues. We'll talk about um, public opinion in the South on LGBT issues. Uh, and Christy Mallory, who's a lawyer at the Institute, is going to talk um, about some of the research uh, in particular that we've done focused on, <laughs> focused on <laughs> uh, discrimination issues. Um, I'm going to start by giving a presentation called The LGBT Divide, which I actually created with Andrew and some other researchers at the Institute about a year and a half ago. And it was really designed. Um, uh, I think for the LGBT movement, in particular the movement that's on the East Coast and the West Coast, to say, hey, some great things have happened. Uh, you know, the Supreme Court has decided on marriage equality, um, but the advances are not happening equally in all parts of the country, and there's a lot of work to be done. So I've given this presentation in New York City, I've given it in Los Angeles, um, I've given it in Chicago, uh, in St. Louis, which is probably the closest I've gotten to being off the coast from Missouri uh, to doing it, but I have never given this out, so it would be great to, um, to get uh, your reactions uh, to the presentation and then kind of your on the ground understanding. Um, there's no way I would remember everyone's names if I went around, but do you mind if we go around quickly and you can, if you just tell me kind of what state you're from or what state and city, um, it'd be great to get to a little bit of sense of who's in the room. Johnson City, Tennessee. Okay, great. High Point, North Carolina. Cool. From DC, live in Virginia. Okay, great. Birmingham, Alabama. Great. Atlanta, Georgia. Malaysia, Mississippi. Columbia, South Carolina. Fantastic. Nashville, North Carolina. Okay, great. Also from Nashville. Nashville. Jackson, Mississippi. Okay, great. Ah, Knoxville, Tennessee. Okay. Raleigh, North Carolina. Great. Um, originally in Massachusetts, but now I live in Nashville. <laughs> Durham, North Carolina. Okay. Durham, North Carolina. Great. North Carolina. Great. North Carolina. Great. New Orleans, Louisiana. Fantastic. I presently cover North Carolina. Okay. <laughs> Durham, North Carolina. Okay, good. Hot, hot bit. Hot bit. Hot bit. <laughs> right. Durham. We got Durham and Asheville. We're well in the same. Asheville. Great. Durham. Durham. Good. Yeah. North Carolina. Okay. Mitchell County, North Carolina. Okay. 
the same right now. Good, good. So a lot of people from North Carolina, but from people uh, from all over, and like I said, I'm from Missouri. I actually lived in.